Welcome to the fifth YPAT webinar, this time talking about controlling the activation sludge process. My name is Oliver Greveson, I'm the technical lead at SEDTEC Control Systems and the Executive Director of Water Industry Process Automation Control, and I'll be hosting today's proceedings. We're lucky today to have a range of speakers from the water industry talking about numerous different ways of controlling the activated sludge process. Our first speaker is Live Riga, who is the Chief Executive Officer at In Control Solutions. Live is a well-respected expert from around the world in activated sludge plant control. And he's gonna to speak to us about the basic process control fundamentals and how an understanding of the system leads to better controller design, which of course leads to better performance of the activated sludge plant system. So without further ado, I'll introduce Live and let him take over. Thanks, Oliver. Nice uh, introduction. Um, so I'm the first uh, in a line of quite uh, a noted speaker, so I have the, the highest chance of messing up your, your schedule. Um, so let's, let's jump right into that. Um, I'm not quite sure how to move my slides. Okay, that seems to work. So uh, what I would like to uh, talk about today is uh, about process control fundamentals and I throw in quite a number of, of uh, process fundamentals as well and then I apply that to an example which is ammonia based aeration control. So unfortunately for SRD control that uh, I would need a little bit more time so I, uh, I don't go into details there but happy to answer any, any questions. Good so let's jump right in um, into control fundamentals. So there are two basic principles for, for uh, control loops and the classic one really is feedback control typically uh, executed or implemented uh, in, in the form of a PID controller. I also don't go into the details and the math and, and all the tricky parts here. So the feedback control really is that you want to control a certain variable and you define a set point here and then of course you want to make sure that your control variable is uh, around the set point. So the special thing here is um, that you measure the process response. Right? So that's quite important to understand. That means you don't fully have to understand what's going on inside the process because you measure the control variable coming out, so the response. Uh, the other concept is feed forward control, right? So you still have a controlled variable and you still want to maintain that variable around a certain set point, but you are actually measuring the disturbances. So what is impacting the process? Yeah, so very important to understand that if you measure the disturbance, you are much faster, right? So you get uh, information on what may impact uh, your, your process early on, but you need a model, right? Because you're not knowing what comes out and how the process actually reacts. So you need a model of the system and you can keep that very simple, but Right, so the, the better the model, the more accurate your control decisions, the more accurate, typically the more con uh, complex, uh, and that means typically you need more sensors. And it's still a model, so you need certain safety margins uh, to protect your effluent in, in the case of wastewater treatment. So much faster, so there are situations where you have to do that, where a, a feedback controller would fail, but you need a model and I would say you must always complement that by a feedback signal. Uh, I think we will uh, learn about that later on. So feedback signal can be that you, you run a model where you recalibrate or you, you combine that with a feedback controller. Yeah? So in wastewater treatment, I would say most of the applications uh, feedback control would be sufficient, but there are certain cases where uh, it would make sense to go for feed forward. Okay, 
So this is a slightly different uh, description or visualization, uh, quite simplified here. So this is the uh, DO controller, DO set point and control variable. And typically you calculate the difference between uh, the two as an error and then you apply your control logic on it. Yeah? So the output, so the controller uh, output, what the controller calculates, we call manipulated variable and important are these upper and lower bounds, right? And we will learn about them uh, later in the presentation. At the bottom, this is how we vis visualize. So vis visualization is very, very important um, because the operators have to understand if the system works or not and what the system is doing. So it helps you a lot in maintaining that in operation. So what we typically do is uh, we plot the, the set point and the control variable on the left hand side. They have the unit, the same unit, that's very easy. And on the right hand side, manipulated variable and the controller bounds. So very important is in the end um, that if you are hitting a bound and the bounds are to protect your process and your equipment, if you are hitting a bound, your controller is off. If you are hitting a bound, yeah. so, oh, I have a bad echo right now. Okay, that, that's off. Um, so very important to realize if you check controller performance, if you are hitting a bound, that controller is actually not doing anything. It's just sitting on the bound. Good, so uh, to make it a little bit more complex, so we discussed the single um, control loop implementation. And now uh, this is uh, an implementation of an ammonia-based aeration controller. And we see that um, this is done in form of a cascade, right? So you have that is the ammonia control loop. Uh, the ammonia control loop calculates a DO set point, which is picked up by the DO controller, and then there's an airflow set point, and the airflow controller then calculates a valve position, uh, and then you have typically uh, something to set, so a valve positioner uh, to actually execute that control action, right? So a full cascade, yeah? So to make it even more complex, <laughs> um, this is just one control loop, right, or one, one controller. Um, so if you have multiple aeration grids, controlled aeration grids, then this adds, so doubles or triples or whatever, um, the number of, of uh, controls. Then you may have multiple trains. And keep in mind that is all only air distribution control. You also have the air supply control, uh, or in other words, the blower controls. Yeah, so it becomes quite complex. Uh, and the way we deal with that complexity is that we put all of that into a model, um, modeling everything from um, the, the blowers, uh, blower control, maybe most open valve control, uh, the main headers, basin headers, drop legs, manifolds, laterals, uh, up to the diffusers which is the connection with the, the process. And then of course, also the DO and airflow control. If you model something successfully, of course, then you fully understand the system. Yeah, so this is the way we design uh, or customize control solutions, uh, having a more holistic view on things. Uh, and we actually combine that with a process model uh, allowing us to have all kinds of, of uh, influence and temperature scenarios. We include operational changes. We can even model equipment or sensor failures. We model the sensors with the response times and the noise. Uh, very detailed models of, of the control system. This is a one-to-one one -one implementation in the model uh, compared to what you would have at the plan. Equipment models I showed before and you can even do cost calculations. Yeah, so very important. If you want to take the risk out of commissioning, do that upfront uh, and you know what will happen and you have a much more holistic view on things. Um, so brief uh, procedure we apply when we um, um, set up a control system. Um, we start with defining process goals with our clients. 
right? And very important is to prioritize these, these goals. Um, I will walk you through an example, so ammonia-based duration control um, later on. Um, to make it easier to understand, right? So right now that's process goals. And then the most important step in, in control system design is translating uh, the process goals into control goals, right? So that has to do with defining what you measure uh, and what the actor agents are, yeah? Uh, then we want to identify any process and equipment limitations. I, I'll discuss that uh, with the example of ammonia-based duration control. And we go into the uh, designing the control structure. If we use P, PI, PID controllers, uh, any model-based control and so on. Yeah? And then uh, setting bounds, very important uh, to set the right bounds. Uh, and then of course, tuning of the control loops. So let's jump into that example. Um, and uh, specifically into process limitations. Yeah? So that is very important to understand for ammonia-based duration control. Most of the control systems I saw failing, people didn't have a proper understanding of process and uh, equipment constraints, right? So the first one for ammonia control really is a kinetic constraint, uh, meaning if you reach DO of let's say two milligram per liter in, so a qualifier is in all sections of the plant, right? So not only where you measure DO, um, then more DO is not help, helping. So increasing aeration intensity, sending more air into the tank will have no impact, right? So that's very important. Ammonia control is very powerful in the other direction. So if you switch off the air completely, there is no aeration, uh, nitrification left, right? However, if you increase, there is a limit. It's saturating and more air is not helping. Very important to design that uh, uh, or in the design stage. The other one, so that is even less understood, is there is a constraint or process limitation coming from the mass of the organisms. In our case, the nitrifiers, right? So the, the mass of nitrifiers in your system depends on the average load, uh, let's say, the, the, the two weeks before, right? So that depends on the sludge retention time you're running. So that means that you have a certain mass of nitrif active nitrifiers and at times you overload that or you underload. And you have to understand that your controller manipulating aeration, so aeration intensity has, has no power to overcome that limitation. Yeah, very important to understand. You would have to go outside that control system, change the sludge retention time. So the higher the sludge retention time, the, the lower these ammonia breakthroughs, for example. Um, and then if you uh, control sludge retention time, um, typically the problem is that at a certain point you cannot go higher uh, with the mixed liquor suspended solids because your clarifiers are limited, are limiting. Good, so important is that you understand your process before you start designing the control system. Um, so now into equipment limitations. Um, and for ammonia-based duration control, we, we typically uh, have these four main limitations. Uh, the first one is diff diffuser distribution and uh, valve uh, sizing. And basically that defines your air distribution within. Right, and it also defines it in places where you don't measure DO, right? So you don't know what's going on. So it's quite tricky uh, to understand. So one message here is a bad design of your aeration system can break your control. Or in other words, the best control in the world would not be able to overcome that. Yeah? The other one is lower capacity. Uh, for ammonia-based aeration control, it's the, the, the downturn, so the minimum. Uh, airflow for mixing, you want to maintain that, of course. And then diffuser specs, uh, so airflow per diffuser. 
Um, be careful, for example, with ceramic diffusers, you can destroy them uh, if you are going lower than the minimum. Yeah? Good, so important here is that all the parts have to work together and that means process, equipment, sensors and the control. Right? In my opinion, the only way to really figure that out is to put that into a very detailed model and we are using SimmerSharp for that. Okay, so that's the, now the example with the process goals and translating that into control goals. So if we discuss with, um, the, with clients, there's typically a whole list of things they want to achieve with that control and we moderate that discussion and then help them uh, setting priorities. So typically for ammonia-based aeration control, the first thing is save energy. If we translate that into a control goal, that is that we want to vary the aeration intensity to maintain an ammonia set point. So that means we measure, we have to measure ammonia uh, and we have to make sure that we somehow can manipulate uh, the aeration intensity. So that all is to reduce nitrification. So we are limiting nitrification uh, and that saves us energy. Yeah. Good, so the next one uh, we sometimes hear is reduce ammonia effluent peaks. Um, so this is uh, something which is a bit tricky. So again, so increasing aeration intensity has its limit. If you reach two, there's nothing happening anymore. So uh, you, you should actually switch to a different control handle, which is increasing the mass of active nitrifiers. And that is typically done by using swing zones Swing zones uh, control is quite tricky, so I would be very, very careful and model that uh, up front. Uh, it's not that straightforward. Um, the next one, maybe increase total nitrogen removal or, or let's say increase denitrification. Um, and there, it's a question of priority. So if it's um, second priority, I would just leave it up to the ammonia controller. So you lower the, uh, the DO and you will introduce simultaneous nitrification, denitrification. So you increase total nitrogen removal as a side effect, right? So if you want to have that as a priority, you would set that up differently. Yeah? Uh, bio P performance, same, same thing. Um, you can see that as a side effect, if that is the main focus, then you have to design a specific control solution for that. And typically the plant will tell us uh, that of course we have to maintain our permit. That's correct, yeah? so we all want that. Uh, the question is uh, how comfortable are they to let's say have ammonia breakthroughs, uh, what extent, uh, and of course the, the safety margin. So that, let's say the permit is written as a daily average um, then how far away do you want to stay uh, from, from the permit? Yeah? So you have to discuss that with the client and make sure you're all on the same page and uh, to be able to include that uh, in your design. So the tricky bit here is that um, reduce ammonia effluent peaks. If you change, uh, let's say, uh, the, swing zone, the swing zone operation, that's a different uh, actuator than aeration intensity. Yeah, so you these are independent controls, shouldn't be completely independent, so you have to coordinate them that they're not fighting each other. Um, but basically you use different actuators and you have to keep that in mind that it's not just one does it all. Yeah. So um, the, the classic ammonia-based aeration control implementation, and this is the standard we are doing most of the time, is that we have a cascade ammonia DO airflow. Uh, ammonia typically measured uh, at the end of the tank. Um, then uh, DO, rule of thumb is one third downstream from the head of the tank, but we would re refine that uh, based on the model because it heavily depends on the diffuser distribution. And then uh, airflow, uh, you would measure uh, per controlled uh, zone. Uh, there are other uh, ABIC implementations, um, for example, direct uh, ammonia-based aeration control. So ammonia directly on valve position or airflow loop. I would clearly not recommend that. Very difficult to tune. 
uh, not protected against uh, high ammonia load. And it, it's just the, not the correct um, setup, I would say. Um, feed forward, feed back combination, in my experience, typically not required. There are certain cases where it makes sense, um, but then use a different um, actuator. So for example, swing zones uh, to have that uh, impact you, you need. Um, keep in mind uh, that typically increases cost because you need more sensors you have to maintain, complexity increases and you uh, have to uh, also maintain your model. Yeah? Uh, same with model-based uh, predictive uh, models due to cost and complexity. I see that rather for larger plants, right? So that, that is quite tricky to set up uh, and maintain. Uh, I don't see that the cost benefit analysis would be positive for smaller plants. Okay, so feed forward control makes sense if there's a problem with how fast the system reacts to changes. Um, typically, in my experience, there is none, or uh, you have to work on other things to mitigate that and keep the, the, that control system simpler. Okay, so commissioning operation. Uh, if you want to actually sustainable operate uh, that control system, and I would count ammonia-based aeration control and SRT control into advanced control already. Uh, most plants will not uh, have an easy time with that. Most important, and you see that in all four boxes, is visualization. Make sure that the operators get information on how it works. Uh, a big thing is maintenance and quality control, uh, and then you want to monitor equipment and the process. You want to know what the process is doing, of course, any special event. And then you want to link that to the control system. So we have developed uh, a number of controller performance metrics to be able to monitor that at all times, indicating if better tuning would improve performance, right? So that's that's very important to understand. Tuning is not helping all the time. So if the controller is sitting at a bound, the best tuning would not improve, right? Because the controller is not active at all. So it's sometimes you have to go outside your control uh, controlled uh, system and change the, the sludge retention time, for example. Yeah? A couple of examples before I wrap up. Uh, so this is our standard controller monitoring view. So you see uh, the controller cascade here uh, indicating something is wrong. So that is actually bad tuning here. Um, and this is the actual uh, situation and the actual measurements here. That is very uh, helpful or proof very helpful to provide information to the operators what control structure they they have, right? So it's the hidden technology. So if it works, nobody knows how the DO is controlled. Bringing it that to light is very important. And then they have the option to actually check every single control loop. And at the bottom, you see again, uh, so this is the green is the set point, blue is uh, the control variable, in this case, ammonia, and black is the manipulated variable. Uh, not well performing, so you see that bad. Uh, this ac uh, actually tells me that with better tuning, you would improve the performance of that system. Yeah? So visualization is very, very important to make the system, a uh, control system work uh, after commissioning and not just switched off. Yeah? Uh, sensors, right? So you need to, to make sure that your sensors provide the, the the right results. Here you can see that's an ammonia analyzer and we fully had that thing under control. Very good instrument uh, and actually it works. We also organize maintenance uh, in that implementation. That's Grand Rapids in, in Michigan in the US. Um, so this is uh, more advanced. That's a detailed analysis in auto tuning. Uh, in blue, the current settings, green, the, the calculated ones by our, so it's a model-based auto-tuning uh, system. Uh, and then you can see the improvement in that controller metric or controller performance metric uh, 
uh, again, visualization that you see what's happening. Yeah. Good. Um, so take home message. Uh, so if you go into controller design, start with a clear objective, right? Only then can you uh, translate that into uh, process goals, uh, sorry, control goals. Um, you need to understand the process and equipment limitations. And in the end, in my opinion, um, the only way really is to put everything together, process, equipment, sensors, um, process, and, and the control, right? So if you put everything together, you fully understand that, and uh, then you take out the risk out of commissioning. Good. Uh, maintenance, you have to get uh, the different parts under control. Um, so we, we do monitoring of sensors, process equipment, and the controllers. And again, uh, I repeat that uh, maybe not even often enough uh, visualization is key. So if you, uh, maybe not even often enough uh, visualization is key. So if you recognize all that, uh, control is actually providing lots of benefits. You're dealing with, with the inherent uh, dynamics of your system and you can just get more out of your treatment plan. Right, so you improve the water quality and you can also s save on or reduce uh, resources uh, and you, you also increase the resilience of your system. Okay, with that, um, I'm done and happy to take So, any thank you very much for that live. We've yeah. got um, one question from Laurie Reynolds whilst I load up the next presentation. How many plants are operating under the in-control models? We use the models first for the design, right? It doesn't mean that we are using the models for the control or in operation. Um, so these are two different things. So we, we oh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> so we, we designed or uh, troubleshooted a lot control system. So the last study we finished just a couple of weeks ago was, was the city of Toronto, one of the largest plants uh, in North America. Um, we worked Denver Metro, uh, Los Angeles County, Fort Worth, yeah, so that's a long list uh, of, of plans. Um, so the, the platform is under development, so we have a full-scale implementation uh, in Grand Rapids in Michigan, uh, so that's the first generation. Uh, and currently we are testing the new generation in Germany and, and the US. Uh, okay, thank and, you. Uh, I hope that's answered your question, sorry. Some more. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Harry, did you have a question? Here we go from Harry. Are some plants only using ammonia or DO sensors or are all, all sites using both? There are some plants only using ammonia, but I, I would strongly recommend not doing that. Um, so multiple reasons. Uh, one is that the fallback strategy for me is DO control. Right? So we have to make sure that, let's say, the ammonia sensor analyzer fails or is under maintenance. You have to switch to, to something else. Right? And I typically like to go to the underlying DO control system. That's what the operators are used to. Uh, and then you're using as a fallback um, a controller which is active all the time. Right? So that makes it much easier. Uh, also, if you have very high um, ammonia concentrations and you're running into a limit, if you're not using DO, you will heavily overrate. Yeah? So that system is, is I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. But of course, there are plenty of uh, so plans. So next question um, from our next speaker, funny enough. What are your views on artificial intelligence to build models? Uh, I, I, I uh, don't like the, the terminology. So artificial intelligence, what people th call artificial intelligence, for me, is just pure math. Um, we call that data-driven models. We use that a lot, right? So we, we have uh, one team uh, focusing on, on data-driven modeling and data analytics. 
um, very, very helpful. Uh, if, you, if you are running uh, models at all times, uh, then typically the, the data-driven models are more robust than the mechanistic models, right? So that has to do that uh, data-driven models can take into account all the variables, right? So input, output, in reactor, everything, pictures. Um, so they are typically more robust and they provide the ability to use diagnostics. Yeah? So self-diagnosis is very important. These models will if properly set up, will tell you that they don't work anymore, right? And mechanistic models, to be honest, the only thing you, they do is provide more data. So you still need an expert knowing where to look, yeah? Uh, so in general, data-driven models, there is a huge market. We actually use hybrid uh, approaches. We, we prepare the data using data-driven models for cleanup and augmentation feed that into mechanistic models.